for me for my final time, uh, may I welcome you to today's Cabinet meeting. Thank you to everyone who's joined us today, whether you're here in the County Hall or on the webcast looking at home out of the rain. We have a fairly short agenda today, but some important decisions nevertheless to make. One of those is a contract for a stop smoking service that we hope will encourage more people to kick the habit, enjoy a better quality of life, and can I say it, also have a lot more money in their pocket, and deliver long-term savings for the County Council, but more importantly, for the National Health Service. Something else that affects people's health is poor air quality, and the update on the Surrey Transport Plan explains how we're working with our district and borough partners and colleagues to reduce the pollution from vehicles. Uh, some of us grew up many, many years ago, in my case an awful long time ago, but the young children today are actually breathing these fumes in every single day. Uh, so many of us did never have to worry about things like that. So we need to be careful about what the pollutions they are uh, taking into their bodies. As well as the budget monitoring report, there is also an opportunity in a report on revised financial regulations which helps to ensure the Council of Finance are managed in an open and consistent way. But before we begin today, uh, there are um, a number of procedure matters we must deal with. So item one is apologies for absence. Yes, Chairman, there's one apology from Claire Curran. Okay, I think she's on holiday. We'll have to talk about people having holidays, won't we? Uh, item two, minutes of the previous meeting of the 30th of October 2018, which I know you've all read. And I think Mary, Angel, Mary Lou is sorry, my apologies, Mary, would like to give an update on a letter we received from the Secretary of State. Mary, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, yes, this is a matter arising from minute 172 of leak 18. Um, at the last Cabinet meeting, when we were discussing whether or not we should appeal to the Secretary of State um, to overturn decisions of the Schools Forum, which would firstly permit us to transfer 0.5% of the schools block funding to support the high needs block. That was going to affect all schools equally, regardless of their governance arrangements. But we also decided to appeal uh, for powers to enable the Council to introduce a, a control mechanism on schools' excessive balances to support the high needs block. But that would only apply to maintain schools. And colleagues around the table um, expressed disappointment that to the, that this didn't apply to all schools equally. In other words, it didn't apply to academies. Um, some of the balances held by academies may well have been built whilst they were maintained schools and transferred with them into the academy. And it seemed to us this was an inequity in the system. Uh, so, in Surrey, we've worked really hard to maintain our family of schools, regardless of governance, free schools, academies maintained. But if we would, you know, when we do things like this, which we can only do in maintained schools, we're undermining that family of schools that we're trying to uh, create. So you, therefore, leader, agreed to write to the Secretary of State on all our behalf uh, to ask him to allow a clawback of excessive academy balances in Surrey, as well as the maintained schools. And I wanted to report to colleagues that we've had a reply from the Secretary of State for Education, Damien Hines. Um, in a nutshell, he says this isn't possible. Uh, under current arrangements, um, we'd have to have uh, uh, new primary legislation uh, to enable us to do this. And he also said that even his department has no right to claw back balances from academies. So it does show just how much power academies have, and they're independent of the Department for Education as well as independent of the local authority. Uh, so it's disappointing that uh, we can't uh, make treat all schools in Surrey equally, but I wanted you to, to, um, to all colleagues to, to know that we had received this reply. Thank you. I, I thought, uh, as is my last cabinet meeting, I could express my deep disappointment with the Secretary of State. I know he's only been in post a, a short time, but the reality is that the system has been set up whereby academies have taken public funds, public land, for the benefit of, of the academies, which I think is unfair on council taxpayers. Uh, all of the council taxpayers, all 870 odd thousand in Surrey, have paid good money to look after our schools and our education for the lifetime of parents and children for the future. And when I see substantial sums of land and buildings being channeled off for private companies to run, I, I, will, ex I will have no hesitation to say I'm highly disappointed. 
public money should be spent on public use. It should not be allowed to be used by private companies because basically that's all an academy is, it's a private company. So I'm extremely disappointed. And I do think there's an issue we have in politics today that there is a, too much of this can't do, won't do, don't want to do. And I think we need a bit more like we do in Surrey. We can do. We change the way we do things. I hope Governor is listening today because I am extremely disappointed in the response. Okay, we'll go on to, now I've had, got that off my chest, we'll go on to item two, Minister, um, item three, sorry, declarations of interest. Does anyone have a declaration of interest on today's? Apart from Cameron and Alison. Yeah. All right. Um, item four is members' uh, procedural uh, matters. We have two questions from uh, members of the public. There are none from, from members. So the first question I've got is from Mark Welling, the chairman of, is, are you Mark? Please come Chairman of the new, new SPAL, and um, Mark, thank you for your question. Uh, my cabinet member, Denise Turner-Stewart, has pr provided a response. Uh, if you've got anything you'd like to add, please do so now. Um, th thank you, Chairman. Uh, I was very pleased with the response. Um, uh, Councillor Denise Turner-Stewart tells us that the uh, proposal that we have been made, the essential proposal, which was first in March, the detailed proposal was given to you in November. If that comes to the February Cabinet, um, that will be extremely welcome and it will give you enough time to get the number of chairs you will need for the number of people who will be here uh, for that item. Um, I do have a supplementary though because if that would imply, as I understand the timetable leading up to your Cabinet meetings, that um, the results of the consultation will need to be available for uh, you to consider and include in a report in perhaps the middle of January. So I wonder if you could say uh, when the consultation is likely to be uh, launched, the period for which it is intended uh, it should be open, bearing in mind that we're in the Christmas and New Year time. And um, essentially, since it's a binary decision between an actual proposal on the ground, which we have prepared for you, um, and what the service would be like if it remains in the um, Council's cash strap library service. Um, I wonder if you'd be kind enough to confirm that it will include uh, an honest and detailed description of what the future of the service is likely to be if it remains in the Council's service. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you for your supplementary questions. So the, um, the consultation will begin in early December. We would like to keep it as brisk as possible for your purposes, so we'd be looking at a four-week consultation or a six-week consultation if you would prefer. However, we're mindful of the time pressures. And with regard to um, the choices within the consultation, they will be very clear as to what you're proposing and the status quo. So it will be a fairly clear um, interpretation for your users and um, members to be able to um, interpret and to make their decision based on the information available. Can I just, on behalf of the members of this authority, thank you and your colleagues for all the work you've done. It's really appreciated, by the way. All right? Well, we'll hope we'll be out of your hair by the end of February, Chairman. Well, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect us to go away if we're not here in February. All, all I can say is you'll be out of my hair. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean that in the nicest possible way. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to add that there was considerable concern amongst the Cabinet for the fact that we did have to consult. It is a, we do have a duty to consult and that's the monitoring officer's decision, but I think we all want this to be as smooth a transition as possible and we all support you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I, I do understand that. Um, we have had quite a lot of responses which are more cynical than I am about that. Um, and so, you know, there is quite a lot of anger amongst the community because it is not in. But I do understand the reasons why it does require a consultation. Before you go, let me try and explain if I can put this into context for you because I think that's really important. The issue we have at Surrey County Council is we, over the last eight, nine years, we have saved 540 million from our costs. So we've done everything we can to reduce our costs. At the same time, the government is taking substantial sums of money off us. But what's really hitting us and what's really hurting now is that every year we're losing 66 million, which is 48 million for adult learning, um, 
14 million on public health and 5 million on a company of asylum suit, which we have to look after by law. So these are statute duties we have. We have no option but to do them. But it's that 66 million every year is starting now to really hurt. It's almost like a slow cut in your side where it's all right, you think it's been looked after, but it's not. And it's really hurting this council. We have appealed to members of parliament. I have written to members of parliament on numerous occasions. I've had discussions with members of parliament, but we're getting no help from them. So if you're able to have a conversation with any members of parliament, by all means, and I'll provide you with the detail. Is that okay? Thank you. On to the second question, Diane Thornton, a local resident. Is Diana here? Uh, you'll see the reply that's been provided for you by uh, Mike Goodman. Uh, do you have a supplementary or not? Um, Shall I start again? Okay. Yeah. okay, thank you, Chairman, and thank you for the reply. But the response doesn't actually address my two questions, and assurances that the Council takes these issues seriously was an assumed starting point for my question. The situation, however, warrants rather more than simply being seen to be doing something. So my supplementary question is that scientists warn the world is facing its sixth extinction event with 60% of wildlife already lost in the past 50 years. Humanity in Surrey will not be exempt from this event. It's a threat which has been described as more dangerous than both world wars combined. So how does the council propose to keep the people, landscape and wildlife of Surrey safe if it does not adopt the new deadlines and quotas recently issued by the UN and by scientists and, by, and referred to in my previous question. Mike. Thank you, Dan, for that. And um, I really appreciate you bringing this to us. I would just like to stress your second point about Bristol. Yeah. I don't know if you have done any research, but I did. Mm -hmm. And Bristol produced in 2015 this report. Unfortunately, the reason they had to take the emergency measures last week is because they didn't enact it. What you're going to see today in the agenda is a very clear strategy, what, we're, what this council is going to do for low emissions EV strategy and improving our environment, and we will deliver that. Now, what you can do as councils, you can say you're going to do things, not do them. What I'm going to be committing today is delivering that whole issue of what we can do to improve our environment. When you talk about wildlife, interestingly, if you look at the wildlife in Surrey, in the last 10 years we've seen an improvement in wildlife because of the excellent way Surrey um, Wildlife Trust deal with our environment. So it's not all uh, deal with the um, um, species. So it's not all about the environment issue. I do agree with you, however, we have a duty, and it is in our mission, state, our, our vision for the council to improve the environment and the health and well-being of the public. And we will do all we can do, but a lot of the issues that you raised are, to a certain extent, outside our control. But what I can say, because um, I know the Secretary of State from the environment quite well, and he is so committed to improving and in, in also taking action on the many points that you've raised. And I will make sure that your um, questions that you've asked of me today, I pass on to him and see what his answer are, because I do think they are more of a governmental action. But you can be rest assured today, when you leave, is that we will be taking action as Surrey County Council. And the crucial part is, is where the deadline is, because the government's deadline is 2050, and Bristol brought their deadline back to 2030, and scientists are saying it should be 2025 for zero emission. 
I can understand that, but we can only go on what the government... Uh, we, we are going to do all we can to bring our emissions down, and I think some of the things I hope you read that we are planning to do in this council will bring that down. But we are just one council. It does need concerted effort throughout the UK and throughout the world. It doesn't. Each council needs to be asked to I do their part. I don't disagree, path. and that is what I think you'll find we're trying to do. Thank okay. you. Item 4C, which is petitions. Any received? Well, you've got to earn your money, you know. Um, <laughs> item 4D, representations received on reports to be considered private. Thank you. Reports from select committees, which is from the Environment Select Committee, which is Rachel. Rachel, would you like us to take this with item 8, and then you can be part of the discussion when we're doing this. Is that all right? Ah, well, why don't you have a seat there, and um, if anyone tells you you're on the cabinet, you can say you're just visiting today. Okay, item, so we then go on to item six, which is the leader and deputy leader of cabinet members' decision. There were a couple of decisions made, the first by Colin on uh, dean of notification, etc. Uh, then one by uh, Claire or Mary, Claire wasn't it, and Mary's here, and then there was one that was made by the investment board. Do members have any questions they'd like to raise in any, or are we happy to accept them? Okay, are we all happy? Thank you. So we've got, we now go on to item 7, which is the approval to award a contract for the provision of a stop smoking service. Tim. Um, thank you very much, Leader. Um, in fact, this is a renewal, effectively, of, a, of an existing contract and a continuation of that policy to encourage people to uh, stop smoking. Uh, that's part of the wider uh, determinants of, of health and part of our uh, 2020 uh, 2030 vision um, for Surrey and obviously part of the key part of the NHS plan uh, uh, which, uh, which we'll see uh, earlier than in the next year. So smoking is, is the single biggest cause of uh, mortality um, and certainly that's the case nationally and, and in Surrey and it costs uh, the NHS about 200 and just under 260 million a year uh, to deal with uh, issues arising from uh, smoking uh, and the total cost of the NHS in Surrey uh, is, uh, is 54 million. So these are significant sums of money. Um, uh, and, and it, but it isn't just about the money, it is, it is about uh, healthier, healthier lifestyles. Just some statistics, between 2014 and 16 there were nearly 4,500 deaths attributable to smoking just in, in Surrey alone. Uh, and over 8,000 hospital admissions. So what uh, this uh, service um, uh, seeks to do is to, um, to uh, intervene to provide support services to smokers uh, and to encourage them to, to stop smoking. Um, in in the, over the last two years, between 2016 and 2018, um, uh, of those that signed up for this service, um, over 3,000 uh, residents quit smoking. So a significant uh, number um, uh, and that, that represented about 70% of those that used the service. And those, that service is particularly targeted on, on areas and on, on parts of our community uh, that have a higher frequency uh, of smoking. So if uh, just looking at this, the key objectives of, of this service, um, it's to provide uh, an evidence-based intervention approach. So it's, it's looking at behavioral support for a, a sort of a 12-week program, um, uh, so specifically targeted at the priority groups, and those priority groups include um, black and minority ethnic groups, gypsy roamers and travelers, uh, and routine manual workers and so on. Uh, so that it will be specifically targeted into into those areas and those types of um, communities. The, uh, there are specific targets, so in year one it's 1,700 and, and year two it increases in year three. So the, the detail of that is set out in, in, the, uh, in the paper, so I won't, won't go through that uh, at any length. But the, the contract, the providers, will be measured on the delivery of, uh, of their performance. So uh, they will be, or they are incentivized uh, financially to uh, to increase the numbers of, of quitters. 
Um, Leader, I think it, it's important to, to look at the equality uh, and impact uh, assessment and just to highlight a, 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 few, um, a, a few areas. Um, I mean, the, the, just to, to make the point, though, that this service is available to, to anybody um, that, that um, uh, seeks to, uh, to, to, to take up the, uh, the offer. It's not, uh, it's not exclusive in that sense. Um, but um, certainly in terms of age, I think one of the, uh, one of the most effective ways to um, help people uh, or to prevent people from smoking is, is to, to get to them early. So uh, children inevitably at some level uh, follow behavior of their parents and, and other adults uh, in, in their environment. So um, targeting uh, adults um, you know, is, is, is a key part to prevent then their children or, or other children uh, from uh, taking up smoking in the first place. Um, physical activity uh, is important, we know generally for health uh, and well-being um, and indeed uh, there's a high preponderance of smoking amongst people with uh, limited physical activity. So that's another area there where we should um, keep a careful uh, eye on. Uh, and then um, lastly, uh, pregnancy and maternity. Um, and I think that's well known that the impact of smoking uh, during pregnancy it does have, uh, as can have significant impact on, on morbidity, mortality, and of course healthcare costs. So the, 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 there's a very full assessment um, in terms of the impact on, on the, the vulnerable members or, uh, of, our, uh, of our communities. So, the, the proposal is to, uh, to let this contract, um, the, the financial details will be uh, in part two, um, but uh, I'm very happy to answer any questions uh, if there are any. Uh, Mel, I'm Alison and um, Cameron, I'm not sure if you'd like to contribute in yeah. a nice way. Mel, first. Yeah, I was interested in paragraph 44, which says that this uh, contract is funded for the Ring Fence Public Health Grant that we get as a county. And then for paragraph 42, it gives a ratio of 1 to 10. Um, so clearly the benefits that we pay, the, the cost that we're paying for now accrue to the NHS. I wonder if there's any way that we can discuss the NHS in terms of our better care fund for an equal proportion of some of their savings to help adult social care, where the cases end up eventually. Um, Alison, did you say you wanted to have a go? Thank you, Chair. Um, no, it's a smile. Um, I'd like to um, say I'm really glad that Surrey County Council is providing Surrey residents an effective um, smoking provision, which will also support Surrey's vision for 2030. Um, I'm happy to be supporting residents and making positive changes to their lifestyles. As a smoker myself, I'm also happy to say I will pledge today to personally use this service and do my best to stop smoking. Um, and I'm also happy to see that our young people have been um, given access to this service. But I did wonder whether we were noting or if we had any figures on any increase, increase in smokers over the age of 18 um, due to the use of e-cigarettes. Because um, I know that there's a lot of young children out there now that are actually taking up the uh, habit. So I just wondered if we could get some information on that. Thank you. Cameron? Yeah, I've been asked to contribute as well because I'm also <laughs> a smoker. Um, and I'm re reading through this report, just a couple of points to make. I mean, it, you know, I'm pleased that this service will look at sort of targeting the most uh, vulnerable people in our community. Certainly providing a, a, a stop smoke service supports residents you know, clearly make choices about, uh, about their well-being. Um, and a targeted service as well, as well helps reduce the health inequalities, I mean, particularly important with, with young people. Um, again, touching upon uh, uh, what, what Tim said earlier, I'm glad that it also ties in with our vision for 2030 as well. Hopefully everybody can hear me now. I'm not a smoker, Chair. I'll declare it. Never have been. But uh, 
On a more serious note, I'm, I'm really pleased with this report, but I would like to see in future, when we're looking at procurement contracts and things, to actually start lowering this age group, so we're actually getting more into the prevention rather than the, uh, the cure, as it were. But uh, a couple of interesting facts that relate to this, I think it's really important to remember. Is that I did a bit of research, and uh, last year, the latest figures that we have for smoking-related deaths in terms of fires in the home is that 36% of all deaths in fires in the home are caused by, directly by smoking or discarded cigarettes. Uh, and that's about two per week nationally. So anything we can do, and it happens in Surrey, it's happened quite recently, anything we can do to reduce that has got to be a good thing. I'd also like to plug the fact that our fire and rescue service actually fits smoke detectors free if people need them. All they've got to do is ask and they'll be fitted free, which is a fantastic service our firefighters do. And with that, a plug, we're coming up to Christmas. People visiting relatives, and it's unusual for this committee, but can I just have a plea that when you go and visit a vulnerable person or a relative, you check their smoke alarm works. And if it doesn't, get them a new one and get it refitted. Thank you. I was quite interested in the table in item 11 on this, so paragraph 11. Um, and interesting to see the percentage treated by GP as almost half from the two, two columns. And I thought, with the engagement you're currently doing with the, um, with the health service, actually, if we can re revigorate that and get the, because the GPs are on direct contact with a lot of these people coming in that are not well, and actually get them also to think outside the box. One of the things we did locally in Woking was we had a, um, a list campaign in the town centre of picking up, um, but some people were getting fines, but actually we waived the fine if they entered Surrey County Council's uh, give up smoking campaign and stuck with it. So look at what other boroughs are doing and look at how they can engage with the boroughs and districts about targeting the audience that is uh, most needed. I think if you look at that table, you'll find that the percentage treated by quid 51 and the percentage in that group has gone up in the year. So with the GPs going down, I'm quite happy to see the GPs uh, surgeries going down and people being used in the proper service. Um, I've got Denise. Thank you. Um, I would just like some assurances around the um, tactics in, um, invoked to address the priority groups. I think it's such an entrenched habit, and I think when we have hard-to-reach groups that perhaps wouldn't be very keen on engaging, it would be very nice to think that they would have, um, have approaches that will be able to engage with these people, especially in areas of high population density, because it is quite a social thing to do, and obviously families are affected by that. So just, if you could just give some assurances on that. Thank you. Okay, uh, before anybody just goes, I think the most important statistic on this paper is on page 22, under why do we need people to stop smoking in Surrey? Very simply, with 4,431 dying over a three-year period and 8,000 hospital admissions, I think that tells us that the smoking is a real issue in life. Uh, unfortunately, I have to say I agree with what Jeff said. Um, I had a very good friend of mine who... I uh, was away on army exercise with me, and uh, unfortunately his wife was sleeping. Uh, a cigarette went out, uh, went on in one of these inflammable cushions that she was sitting on, and unfortunately she didn't survive it, and it, it was a real issue. Uh, I totally agree to you. We need to help people to protect them in their own homes when they're smoking. Tim, would you like to summarise, please? Thank you, Leader. Yeah, just to pick up a couple of specific points, absolutely, to Denise's point, um, I think, you know, GPs are a key part of that, actually. So that statistic is quite, quite interesting in terms of the reduction in the numbers. But, but you know, it is important that, that um, the right people are, are, are accessing and targeting those priority groups. Um, it sounds as if um, this program is helping significantly working borough council in some of its uh, solutions. I'm sure that working would want to contribute to the costs of uh, this scheme perhaps going forward. Um, in terms uh, and, and on contribution of cost, uh, to Mel's point, um, obviously the, we're, we're awaiting the, the green paper from, from the government. You know, we are working uh, as, a, as a county already towards much closer integration of uh, adult social care and health uh, and looking at pooling budgets. So although this is a ring fence grant that has to be used for this, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a good point to be made about whether or not there's some way in which some of the benefits uh, can be uh, shared uh, w with us. I mean, Surrey does actually do better than, it's, it's, it's done better than the national average in terms of uh, numbers of people smoking. Uh, whether, that's, you know, whether that's this campaign, 
uh, or whether that's just a national trend is difficult to know. But the numbers have been coming down uh, year on year. You've had two confessions from the end of the table there. Um, and so at least if we get two of them into the, into the program, that, that, that's going to help. But it is, you know, it, so I mean, I, you know, part of today is, is to just raise the general awareness of this program, uh, you know, and to encourage all of us, if we know people that smoke, to at least have a look at it to see whether it might be suitable for them. Um, cabinet, this paper is asking Cabinet to agree to a new low emission strategy, electric vehicle strategy, travel plans for good practice and car club guide. All these, if agreed, will become part of the transport plan for the future for Surrey. This will ensure our transport policies will support sustainable economy and improves the health of our residents. This paper also helps to deliver the Council's vision that residents live in a clean, safe and green communities. Air pollution contributes to premature deaths and in 2017 5% of Surrey residents died in part by the quality of the air. So we in Surrey do take this responsibility seriously and we must tackle our air pollution. There is no silver bullet to improve air pollution but from government to businesses, local government and residents we all can play our part. And I was delighted only two weeks ago to attend St. Peter's Primary School, Little Lane in Farnham, when a play was delivered to children to help them understand air pollution, particularly around schools, so they can start to make a difference and influence their parents. This production was supported by DEFRA, who we are working very closely with. Education is a key element to improve air pollution and for all of us to recognise the part we all play. I want to now to highlight some of the points, first of all, in the paper itself. Page 9.5 outlines an important step forward, and leaders and chief executives will be asked to consider the Surrey Waste, to use the Surrey Waste Partnership, where members will be able to have oversight of the progress. So far, members have not had the oversight on how we can actually improve air pollution. I think it's an important step forward. I believe it is essential that members are part of the strategy and this is why we've taken that step forward and it is emphasised on page 43.10. Point 11 outlines the EV and low emissions actions and progress to date and point 17 outlines emissions reductions and actions. In arriving at the EV and low emissions strategy, a 12-week consultation took place and a round table event at Surrey University. And I would also like to thank the Select Committee for their recommendations, which were included within the final report. The EV strategy in particular will require grant funding, and I am pleased that the LET will shortly be announcing that funding will be available up to 20 million, which Surrey County Council will certainly be bidding for. I also believe the EV strategy needs to be adopted across the UK. Those with electric vehicles will need to to be able to drive in confidence that charging points are available throughout the UK. And I'll be writing to the government requesting that they give a clear direction to local councils on what type of charging points need to be installed, numbers, types, and the effect on the electricity supply, which could be quite serious. We must have a similar approach throughout the UK. If we don't, we all remember what happened with the VHS Betamac issue of a number of years ago, and I do believe we need one approach. The report did consider if equalities and diversity was required, and it was determined at this time it was not, but we, we should be flexible in the future as strategies are developed. Now turning to the strategies in turn. Low emission strategy. This strategy is an important step forward. It accepts that overall Surrey as relatively good quality air, but there are areas that require attention. And the aim of the strategy is to reduce polluting emissions from road transport. Air quality management areas are measured by the districts and boroughs who have the responsibility to produce their action plans. There are 250 active areas throughout Surrey that are measured and show 
currently unacceptable levels of pollution. Though the, there is a map and there are details of that on page 84 to 86. And SCC will continue to work with our district and boroughs to reduce the level of pollution because it's only by working together in partnership that we can all make a difference. Now turn into the travel plan section. These are now only used, many people would think travel plans are only used by schools. But it also now development and housing and whole scale, and there is a scale of thresholds on page 160 of the strategy, which is, a, which is an important step forward. The money to actually do these travel plans will be secured by, by section 106 agreements. And the paper itself outlines in, in um, exactly how the process will work. Car clubs. There are 26, and only 26 locations in Surrey for car clubs, of which only five are electric. The plan is to increase the number of locations with particularly focus on electric vehicles. This new, for, this new now will form part of housing developments in the future, and we will be secured funding through 106 agreements to ensure that car clubs are, are actually going to be in place in all big-scale developments. More and more people are sw swapping and in deciding not to own their own car, but to use car club. And it is anticipated over the next few years this will significantly increase and this will have a positive effect on our air quality. Turning now to the EV strategy itself, by the end of 2017, the registration of electric vehicles indicated that in fact Surrey was one of the leading areas of electric vehicles and the numbers have increased throughout 2018. Page 107 of this strategy lists the importance of having a comprehensive charging net network. Some can be charged overnight, but many properties that will not, this will not be possible, particularly where you've got apartments. And we need to agree how and where our off-street points should be located. And this will be a, quite a comprehensive piece of work that needs to be done. We currently have only 200 charging points at 60 locations in Surrey and we need to focus on delivering a comprehensive network over the next few years and our bid to the LEPs early next year will be a step forward in developing this. Page 117 section 3 does include how we can start to develop a network of charging points and this will be key in our bid to the LEPs. We also want to encourage electric bikes and on page 131, it's explained there that we wouldn't, our intention is to have a strategy, a cycling strategy for electric cycles. Taxi licensing is included on page 133, and this gives us an opportunity to work across borders and develop a policy that encourages license standards based on, by, based on emissions with our boroughs and districts. A joint approach approach proposed by the Air Alliance could deliver significant reductions in carbon emissions but it needs to be a joined up approach you can't have one borough doing it two others not doing it because people will cross the border into your area using um, uh, higher emissions so it needs to be a joined up approach it is important that we continue to develop a strategy that reduces emissions on our buses and I'm pleased that in December we'll be operating an electric buses um, at the park and ride in Guildford. And this is really good news, in fact, the first one in the UK. We recently agreed new contracts with bus companies that introduced a number of Euro 6 buses, but we need to do more. And we will be developing next year a new strategy with bus companies on low emissions. And I'm keen to increase the number of electric vehicles in Surrey. And I'm also pleased to say that this week we will be showing off our first electric fire engine, which is coming to um, Surrey County Council. Also turning to our own fleet, many of our vehicles are not electro or hybrids, and what we do need to do, as those vehicles come up for renew, we do need to consider um, renewing them to become hybrids or electric, and this point was well made by Select Committee. In conclusion, this paper is important to our residents. It's our residents' future health and part of our 2030 vision. It will take time to deliver, but these strategies are deliverable, and we can do it. Before we go to recommendations, I'm sure one or two might like to ask some questions. Okay, so before we go to the questions, um, Rachel, oh, would you Rachel, like to say about your recommendations from your committee, please? 
Thank you, Chairman. I was very pleased with the recommendations that the committee, the Environment Select Committee, made to the portfolio holder and hopefully to Cabinet's approval um, were all accepted, and particularly the electric bike, because this was not as part of the scheme originally. And may I say, whereas we have a declaration on smokers, I don't smoke, but my husband now rides an electric bicycle. You would have never got him on an ordinary bike. And this, I think, for older people, is not just clean for the environment, because cycles are a bit cleaner, but the health assets towards this are amazing. And those of you that know my husband, I can assure you, he has been using it quite a lot. But I'd like to thank um, Mr. Goodman for enclosing them all. The committee will be delighted. I'm sure they've already read this. But there is one slight correction I'd like to make. I'm not going to apologize, because when we talk about the first fire engine in Surrey being electric, it's actually not a complete fire engine, and we're not trialing it. We are, through scrutiny I have found out, going to be helping our suppliers of fire engines to develop this vehicle, to give recommendations for improvements as well as seeing it. So there is no such thing as a complete fire engine, electric fire engine at the moment. But we are, I feel we should be very proud that we have been asked to be part of this very, very incredible initiative to develop it. And I do hope to be joining you next week down at Ray Park to see it as well. The other thing that I'd like to add is that when we talk about air quality, if I may, um, a comment was made with our smoking program is that children often follow their parents' examples. May I reverse that? As was said earlier, it is often, in my opinion, children putting peer pressure on parents that change parents' perception of things and therefore never undervalue our young people, the education that they're getting in Surrey, to actually affect behaviour change within their family and extended family. Thank you, Chairman. Um, thank you, Rachel, for that. Uh, extraordinary news that Ian is on a bike. I think that will go down in history. Uh, did you want to send anything like it to uh, Rachel, or shall we go around? Well, let, let, you want to pick it up at the end? Let's pick them all up at the end. Okay, I've got Mary and Mel first, and then... Thank you, Chairman. Um, I suppose what I would like, really, from Mike as a Cabinet member, is a reassurance or assurance that we're doing as much as we can. Um, when we had the question earlier in the meeting, I think uh, Diana Thornton, the resident, was not challenging us just to meet our legal responsibilities, but to think about our moral responsibilities for um, ensuring the future of the planet for our children and following generations. So are we going as far as we can with this strategy, and how do you see us developing it over time? You know, this is a starting point. How are we going to make sure that we, we think about our moral rather than just our legal responsibilities? Thank you. And can I contemplate Mary's question? Could you uh, think about, can we uh, sorry, be a role model for the rest of local government? I think that was what the young lady that, in the audience was trying to explain. So Mel, would you like now to have a go? Yep. Um, listening to Mike, uh, it struck me when he talked about the 200 points in 60 locations. And it struck me, first of all, I get very worried with this electric vehicle strategy because this time of the year, maximum demand on our power generation generators comes into force. And we often get told that uh, they're close to brownout positions. So if everybody goes to electric, I'm a little bit concerned about running my Wi-Fi system at home. Um, the second issue that I'd like to ask is that do we have any idea of what the kilowatt hour cost per hour is on these charging points and will we be making any money on these to regain the capital cost that we invest in these points? Uh, 
Uh, thank you. I, I want to pick up on the travel plan um, annex within this. Um, two things, really. I mean, number one, an important point in delivering this, and you did touch on it, but I wanted you to emphasise, was the um, cooperation with the boroughs and districts. As they are the planning authorities, um, and we need to work closely and get them all aligned. Um, and when this is presented with the chief execs and then conversations go on, I think it's really important to emphasise to try and get this into their local planning strategies as well to deliver that. And you touched on the travel plans that are done outside schools. And this, this would, does have a big impact because the amount of parents that keep, uh, keep cool in the summer with their air cons and cars running and keep warm in the winter. And this, has worked, this, this mode, mode shift style system that's worked on travel plans on expanding schools has worked really well. It's been really well engaged with. And I'm pleased to say next year we're rolling this out around non-expanding schools to actually engage with them and give schools assistance in developing this because it has had a positive impact. And I think all local members have had a, um, an explanation coming around the local committees on um, how this is um, engaged and or which schools are engaging so you can uh, help to support that. So, um, but the main thing is about the engagement with the boroughs and districts and getting their support. Is charging. He, uh, two points. One, I think as a, as a council we can work with and encourage boroughs and districts in planning stages to encourage all developers to include charging points in new developments, especially in public buildings. You know, schools, uh, we're just about school uh, planning. Well, if we're looking at planning new schools, well, why can't the staff be encouraged to use electric charging points while they're there? Then the message goes through to the children, as we've just heard. And the second is, I just had a quick look at the 200 charging points in the county, and 60 are, are actually within Guildford Borough. So that means 140 are spread around. But I looked at my, when I saw this on the agenda, I looked around at my local supermarket and found over a two-month period, not one car was being charged on their charging points because the charging point parking places were full of non-vehicles, uh, non-electric vehicles. I think one of the things we need to do there is encourage people not to park, it's a bit like disabled parking, not to park in electric charging points because that not only frustrates people but also means that it falls into disrepute. Thank you. Um, I would just like to ask um, on the back of an extremely um, well put together report for absolute support for our boroughs and districts that are working, especially on the London borders where you have a low emission zone with extremely high levels of um, pollution, Spelthorn being an air quality management area for the whole borough um, in the most wooded county in, in England, which is Surrey. So I would just like to ask that you would support us to be able to try and manage that as best we can. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Bringing in some, a little bit of personal um, input, if I may, an extended member family recently bought a Tesla. Tesla themselves have installed superchargers in certain garages to which their customers can go in and charge free. The moving on aspect is if a customer leaves their car charging after it's already full, is that they're charged or fined seven pounds a minute. So they obviously watch. And any battery that's been charged, they have a clamp because it's better to keep charging your battery and not overfill it. So they, they have a suppressor. But um, I, I wanted to point out that if you go on looking, if you're a householder in Surrey and you go onto the web and you look for a charging point yourself, is that the selection is phenomenal and nobody gives you a reference and the prices vary incredibly. Therefore, I think part of our strategy is possibly we may consider something like a business champion that can work with businesses and the boroughs and the districts specifically on the issue of quality because we, we haven't really got a lot of set advice out there and it's as someone mentioned earlier, Betamax versus VHS. Everyone appreciated at the time, I'm old enough to remember, I'm not sure if our chairman is, that Betamax was far the best quality, but VHS was the organization that got it marketed through the rental companies. Hence, VHS took off, even though they lacked the top quality. So I think at, this, at the beginning, 
I think we should be taking a lead, if I may be so bold to say, is in the quality of what we're recommending people to install. So a business champion can maybe work on that, on that field because that's what does concern me. Thank you. Thank you. Before Mike uh, sums up, I, I just thought it would be useful to listen to the conversations and observe where vehicles have got parking spots and facilities because I, I actually pass one every day on the way when I walk from the station there's a parking spot the Kings and have one of the roads and there's not nearly always a vehicle that are being charged. I wonder whether there's a possibility that we could set up an interactive map on the Surrey, on the Surrey County Council website and allow anyone to, if they've got charging points, to be able to put it onto the map so there's one map for the whole of Surrey. I'm not, I'm not saying we'll commit to it, but let's can we ask officers to go away and look at that idea, whether that is possible to do. I'm sure it is, but I think it would help the more people know mm. there is points, because the big concern when you're going to buy one, I've been looking to buy an electric vehicle, I've had a look at the BMW, uh, but my, my little pension, I'm not sure I can afford it yet, but the reality is, if I knew that I was buying one, and I knew there was plenty of power points around, then I, I would probably look at it. And the other thing we could think about is, at some stages, how do we encourage people to put in a proper PowerPoint at their own house or in the street. In the street. How do we encourage people to put a PowerPoint in a street yeah? so a number of people can use it? We just want to think outside the box a bit. So can I ask you to sum up that? Yeah, if I can take your points first of all. There is a map on, uh, currently that does show all the points in Surrey. But what does happen when you do buy an electric vehicle, there's an interactive map in your car that tells you all the points where you and it tells you the type of charge because there are different types of charge trickle charge fast charge etc and um, that is what's out there now as for um, opera having your own um, point is that the government currently do give you a sum of money it's been reduced in November down to three and a half thousand which allows you to put your own charging point in and that costs 440 pounds depend on who you go to and what charging point so what I would say anybody who's interested in a car in electric car all that information is available if I'm not quite sure um, whether or not we would want to say you ought to use this charging point I think we need to do some work on that because I wouldn't want us to recommend something that actually then um, ended up being wrong. But let me um, come on to all the points that have been raised. Um, first of all, again, Rachel, thank you for, you, for, for, for the Select Committee's comments, and I take the point about the, 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 the fire engine, but I do think it's really exciting, like you do, and I think it's a way forward, and perhaps fire engines should become ambulances and other things as well in the future. Um, your point about children pressure, that's exactly right. That's exactly why I said in my opening um, speeches that I went to a school where we were um, having a, a show for the kids to influence them on the importance. They did not have a clue about the importance of air pollution. And I know they will influence their parents. So that's what we, and what we were saying to the kids, 90% of them will come to the school by car. By the end of it, they realise actually they don't need to come to, to, to school by car and that leads me on to say actually some of the pollution issue is in our own hands we can we, we can do it ourselves um, with what Mary said could we do more I think we can always do more but what I would say is I know we are one of the leaders I think Hampshire is, is doing really well on EV but we're doing very well on clean air because we're working very closely with DEFRA we, we, we actually um, did win a, a grant to, to do this training we're putting educational training we've got another grant going in shortly for another um, sum, of, sum of money I think it's important that we could uh, work um, across our boroughs because I think this is something we need to work together on and it would be good if we could be one of the leaders a lot of things we're doing others are not even considered doing if you look across the country now very few have got these policies in place and by the end of the day, hopefully we will have. So I think we are leading, but I do think then it's the other issue that Mel said about um, charging points and the issue about um, electric. Well, it does depend on when you charge it. If everybody was to have a supercharge and charge it all at the same time, there would be a major problem. But if, in fact, you charge it in the lowest time of um, requirement of electricity, there is no real issue. We can the government have got enough electricity but I'm not confident 
that by 2030, when you've got considerably more cars on the road than you've currently got now, there will be enough. And what I was going to do, um, because I think it's a really good point, but some professors say it's not a problem, but others say it is, is I think it would be good in the letter to the government to say, well, actually, what is your plan? Because it's no good having that if you actually um, haven't got the, the, the capacity. And I do think, as I said, it's really important that you can charge it in Surrey, whether it be at your house or somewhere else, but it's when you go out of Surrey and you come back, you want to be able to come back. You don't want to get somewhere and then cannot recharge your vehicle. And I think that's going to be really important. But there are different types of charging points from supercharge to trickle charge to medium charge. And the issue is there are a lot of different types within that. So I think there needs to be a lot more work. Now, Mark, Colin makes an excellent point. And it's something that uh, I, that's why I wanted the Surrey Waste Partnership to be very much part of listening to what we're doing in pollution so they could oversee it. I've been really concerned that no members have been overseeing across Surrey um, pollution and bringing it into um, the, the Surrey Waste Partnership, I think, is the right way to do it. Because we can only achieve what, we, what is in these strategies if we work together. We cannot achieve it alone. Um, Jeff's point about the development, what I can tell you, Jeff is that from January this year, when you develop so many houses, you, the, the developer has got to put charging points in. That's part, and that was uh, a policy that was developed with all the districts and boroughs, and all of them, as far as I'm aware, have all got that as a policy now, that a certain number of houses, you've got to have an EV, EV point put in. But if you look at the moment that the government are funding that, really, um, it's not, it, the question would be how you do it in the future. Um, Denise, absolutely, I, we support Speltham. We understand Speltham's issues, and I think we've got to be really mindful of the um, third runway and the expansion, and we've got to make sure that the final um, master plan does take into account some of the environmental issues you've got in Spelthorne. Um, you've got the problems now without a third runway. We've got to make sure we've mitigated all that. But I do believe a lot of what I'm putting forward today and we've got to deliver it, though, will help um, spell through. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mike, for that. That was very helpful. Um, and uh, can I just ask you, are we all happy with the recommendations? We accept these plans uh, and put them forward. And perhaps our, our guests today will be able to write to the Guardian and tell that Surrey is at the leading edge of all this. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> Don't be afraid of a challenge. Okay, uh, thank you. We're going to now go on to item 9, which is financial regulations. Uh, a fairly straightforward report we have here. Um, it's, we've had to do some tidying up of our financial regulations, uh, which is very important. There are three recommendations on the paper. Uh, I'm going to ask Charlotte to speak in a minute, uh, and then we will put something in about recommendation 2 after Charlotte spoke. Where are you, Charlotte? Please. Yes, I, I welcome this report. I think it sets everything out very clearly. However, I did notice that the recommendation says that um, members of the Audit and Governance Committee will receive um, the, and, and be asked to sign, sign off on the strategy. However, that's not actually laid out correctly in the underlying document. So I think a little bit of tidying up might be required. Basically, what we're saying is that if we want to add to that recommendation that... Um, the draft financial regulation, which when the presented account will be updated to reflect this change as well, which just needs to be added in before it comes to full council. Are we all happy with that? Okay. Thank you. Going to item 10, which is our uh, finance and budget monetary report. Uh, okay. Today I, I report for the last time as leader on our monthly financial position. This is for September month to end budget monitoring. Our forecast position for revenue is for an underspending against the budget of 4 million, which will reduce the need to use reserves and to support this year's budget down from 21 to 17 million. This is substantially due to the success of the management actions to reduce expenditure by 24 million this year as part of our 40 million in-year cost reduction program. <coughs> I can also report that our capital program is on track with a small forecast in year underspending. The Council is still, however, facing significant spending pressures, 
especially in the area of special education needs and disabilities. Uh, and you'll have heard my earlier comments today, which totally back Mary up in, in this really important point. The continual exception demand for these services is leading to an overspend of 15 million against the budget. We are not alone in this, by the way. When I was at the County Council Network uh, conference this last week, I think we heard from many of our compatriots in, in, uh, there how seriously special education needs the financing and the transport costs were rising at astronomical rates. My big concern is who is listening to us? Local government has got to deliver local government service on the ground, and we need the government to listen to us. But they will do after the 11th of December. However, to the success of our union management actions, we have achieved enough to offset these pressures. Nevertheless, this is not to be complacent, in, as many disabled will not continue into future years, and we remain focused on ensuring that we have a sustainable budget. And this is so important because we've been going on and on to Secretary of State, for three Secretary of State now, starting with Greg Clark when I put the proposal forward for the Fair Funding Review, which he accepted, then to Javid Savage, who is now at the Home Office, dealing with other issues, and now we've got James Brokenshaw. We have to see a Fair Funding Regime, a proper understanding of how local government is going to be looked after in the future. Because it's vital that we do all this to enhance our financial resilience and puts us in a better position to face the challenges and deal with the underfunding uncertainties and service pressures we will face in future years to ensure that Surrey residents have sustainable local services. I think we need to be realistic and ask ourselves a serious question. There's so much going on in Parliament at the moment and I deeply worry who is actually addressing local government issues. Local government, there is no doubt about it, is the one service right in the public that the public respect and know. And when local government has seen 16 billion cut out of their budgets in the last eight years, that's a phenomenal amount. I don't believe any other government department could have put up with that and actually continue to deliver even a better service. So I think we are quietly the heroes of public service out there, but at the end of the day, heroes can only last so long. And I do think that government, if it doesn't sort it out in the spending review round next March and April, I think we have a major issue for local government in this country. Dare I say it as I bow out. Uh, I'm now going to ask, um, Mary is going to, uh, Mary, you want to say something about staffing, didn't you? Please. I'd like to start by drawing everyone's attention to the second recommendation on page 260. Um, the Cabinet's asked to note the change to the structure of children, families and learning um, because this means that uh, our budget for this month is not directly comparable with the previous month. Uh, various changes have happened. First of all, um, lifelong learning and culture has been brought into the directorate, libraries and that sort of thing. And also you'll see on paragraph 5 that the budget envelope has increased by 0.5 million um, with the transfer of voluntary sector to, from democratic services. So as you go through all these numbers, you need to be aware that they don't, don't compare. Obviously, in future, that will be fine. Um, I also wanted to um, talk, uh, when I was just uh, talking about the high level of the directorate, that the uh, transformative change uh, that's going on to improve children's services and SEND um, both involve restructuring and, in the short term, extra staff. So this is detailed in paragraph 16. There's information about more interims and more staff. And I thought it would be worthwhile just quoting from the report that was recently published by uh, the report from our commissioner on the improvement to children's services. Under 5.1, the Commissioner recognises the depth of the challenge and um, the action that's being taken, which he supports. But he says that these actions are of have of necessity been coupled with an extensive change in the senior leadership team, the engagement of interim managers, the implementation of a new structure and recruitment to the structure. And that is reflected in the staffing costs that you're going to be seeing. This is a directorate that's have, you know, on a huge improvement journey and that can't be done without the right staffing. So I think the situation of staffing costs being higher than um, uh, budgeted for is going to carry on for some time. A whole scale restructure is taking place. It should be complete by the end of March. 
but then you know re improvement will be continuing and will require the right people so that's um, my sort of overall message uh, overall in the directorate uh, the overspend is down this month by uh, 1.2 million and that is uh, attributable mostly to the review of savings and culture which we've imported so we've imported some good news into the structure and also the more efficient use of income and grants but this top line figure includes a number of improving situations and deteriorating elements so I'll, uh, I'll break it down for you into some smaller parts first of all in education lifelong learning and culture which we're going to have to get used to as ELLC uh, there's an improvement of 0.9 million since August um, from cultural services basically but there is continuing pressure on countywide send and send transport budgets which uh, the leaders already referred to and I talked to you a lot last month about the increasing number of EHCP so I won't go through that all over again but the, um, the send service in particular the pressure on the high needs block budget was calculated at 30 million 15 million pound containment plan as you know but I regret to say and I'm going to keep on highlighting this that 5.2 million of this remains as a high risk so we can't just assume that, that, that we're down to 15 million overspend um, as the leader said at uh, the CCN conference there was um, a lot of talk about the underfunding of SEND and our, all our neighbours experiencing the same sort of thing and for us as well here in Surrey the volume and cost of the placements and then, uh, keep rising there is a 0.7 million saving on SEND transport. That's due to contract negotiations and, um, and some grant use uh, income has been used to cover SEND transport. But nonetheless, we still have a 1.1 million forecast overspend. Um, so there's, you know, there's really an awful lot in this education, lifelong learning and culture, which is masked a bit by the fact that we've moved um, culture into this area. At paragraph 13, I'd like to draw your attention to a different pressure, which is um, something that wasn't mentioned last month. We talked earlier in this meeting about how uh, when schools academise, their, their um, surpluses go with them into academies. What doesn't go with them is any deficits that they've, uh, they've built up. And at paragraph 13, you'll see that we've got a 0.5 million pound pressure for two sponsored academy conversions which are likely to have deficits and um, our officers continue to focus all the time on trying to keep deficits as low as possible even though we're not technically responsible for school improvement we'll have to keep a real strong weather eye on this and this is why because we keep the deficits when there are forced academizations and uh, we've got half a million of pressure on that paragraph 13 so another section of the budget, which you might call Claire's section, is the uh, budget formerly known as Children's Services. It's now broken down into four sections, which is good, makes it clearer for us to see. Um, each section being impacted by what I've always already talked about, which is our, our improvement journey and the need for the right staff to do this. Um, the first section is safeguarding family resilience. That's forecasting a 0.8 million pound overspend and still has to make its 0.6 million in year cost reductions um, and that is mostly to do with with staffing um, but some of the staffing pressures are partly offset by some vacancies we've got at the moment in the early help service the second part of the former children's services budget is called corporate parenting service here we've got a 1.2 million underspend forecast and it's achieved a 1.2 million um, out of its 2.3 million in-year management actions. And I think a lot of this is attributable to uh, better gatekeeping and placement budget. Well, we've now got a more realistic budget, so we're actually looking at something that is achievable and we've got better monitoring of the impact of spend. But again, if you're looking at staffing, that, to do this gateway, we need very experienced social workers. They've been resourced to do this work. But it is much better for children and young people because we're talking about longer term planning, not emergency placements. And careful, closer to home placements of what we've all agreed we're going to do. So some increase in staff spend, but already you can see um, that 
you know, we are getting to grips with this, so that's good. As with other local authorities nationally, we're still subsidising our UASC services and noted um, that we've got 107 uh, unaccompanied asylum seeking children with us and numbers are rising nationally with an increasing number of po po points of entry coming into the country being used. Um, so we can't expect our numbers to go down, but um, just to make you aware, we're still subsidising. On quality and performance, this is the third part of the former children's services budget area. Um, again, we're looking at improving our conference chair service, our lack review teams. We've had to employ more staff to cover the statutory work because of the increased numbers. That's led to a 0.4 million overspend. In commissioning, there's a forecast overspend of 0.2 million uh, with some management actions remaining. Again, it's staffing, and that, on that occasion, that's about historic inquiries where we've had to uh, have uh, more staffing to make sure that those are done effectively. So, as I said at the beginning, uh, improvements to these vital services along the, sign, the lines of our Ofsted Improvement Plan, which we reported to the Minister, which was validated by the Commissioner, these are going, you know, started and going to be going on for a while, and they can't be delivered without spending on staff in the short to medium term. Keep okay, uh, members, I, I've got, there's a very serious point here of principle. And what Mary has brought up in paragraph 13 in response to the Secretary of State's letter that the Academy's uh, funding remains with the Academy. So the way I read this is that that's fine if the government wants to take that line. But then I think there is another side to this argument. Why should the taxpayers of Surrey pick up half a million pound deficit when the Academy is taking our stock, our assets off the council books and I believe we should now write, and I'd like it done, Mary, a letter to the Secretary of State, and I'd like it copied to Lord Porter at the LGA. What is, why are we having to do this, and what is the LGA doing about standing up and defending the, pub, the schools in our, in our state schools? They should not be handing state schools over, and we are left with a deficit. So for, for me... I don't know how my, the new leader will take it, but if I was still in this post, I would not allow these to go ahead until such time as they signed an agreement to refund this deficit. I think it's a really fundamental principle here. You can't just take away the stock belonging to the county council, belonging to the taxpayers who funded this, and then you can have a nice clean sheet. If you want the, if you want the schools, you take the debt and you give us the money back. So I'd like a letter done the strongest possible terms to David Hines and copy to Lord Porter that we should not do this unless, we, if we are forced, then we should allow the, the public of Surrey to know that the government policy is to allow schools to be transferred into an academy state whilst the council taxpayer picks up the deficit. To me, this is really important as a matter of principle. So I would like it done before I leave in this post on the 11th of December. Is that right, Chief? Thank you. Mary? Thank you, Leader. I'm not disagreeing with anything you're saying, but I think it also points out how important it is that even if it's not fully funded anymore, that we retain some ability within the council to monitor school improve, and to improve schools. Because if we stop them going into uh, becoming failing schools, if we enable them to stay good and outstanding, then we won't have these forced conversions, and it's with the forced conversions that we pick up the de deficit, not when the schools are doing it voluntarily. So if we, we can't just afford to sit back and wait for schools to fail because we are the ones that are going to take the financial hit, or the council taxpayers of Surrey are, um, and so we need to make sure that we have some residual team left that keeps an overview and that we can dive in and get other schools to support if we've got schools that are about to fail. I, I, I agree with you, Mary, because once offset fail the school, they're ready to be snapped up by a, uh, an academy trust, and they take the land, they take the assets, and thank you very much. It makes life so much easier for them. It's another school on, on top of their finances, and then they can spread their costs around. But we and our taxpayers, I'm not happy that our taxpayers themselves are funding this idea, and I think we should be in the strongest terms we should be saying this to the Secretary of State. Does any cabinet member disagree with me? Uh, Tim, are you all right with that? Yeah. Fine. So can we do that, please? 
Okay, and, and actually, can we make it a recommendation that the leader writes to the Secretary of State in, in, as a result of paragraph 13 and will finalise the wedding afterwards? Is that all right? So we have a formal record of it, because I think our residents need to know what's happening out there. Okay, uh, Mel, would you like to do it? Um, Put that off my chest now. Yeah. The service is projecting an underspend of £5 million versus its budget. The report on page 290 reflects the individual savings plans and reflects actions taken in making progress on demand management, which is one of the main transformation programs that the service is operating under currently. Uh, to achieve the revised budget envelope or goal of £371 million, uh, which includes an additional 10.1 million target savings, we still have to achieve a further 5 million by the end of the financial year. Subject to winter conditions, there is a slightly optimistic feeling within the service that this 5 million underspend will be achieved uh, by the year end. In doing so, the service will have achieved the savings target in its base budget of 18.1 million and the additional savings of 10.1 million. Uh, making it another year of 28 to 33 million over my nine and a half years in adult social care uh, that they've saved. Uh, finally, my thanks go to the service who are embracing the change programs uh, and delivering these results. Hold on, Mike. Thank you, Leader. Um, the, the basic budget is uh, similar to last, um, last month and is on target to make the savings um, that have been agreed additional for this year. Um, two recommendations, recommendation three and four within the paper or within this area. Um, recommendation three is around the Farnham Road Bridge. Uh, Cabinet agreed back in October 2017 to support this project um, and it's a part payment towards um, the repairs of this bridge because it is an important uh, link in, in Surrey. Um, and this is to formalise that and, and make, uh, enter this into the uh, MTFP. We're still working with two or three different avenues for accessing the money to recoup this, um, uh, probably through a grant or an interest-free loan, but there's different aspects we're looking at. Um, but this is th the recommendation is just about putting that into the budget. And you'll see there's a slight increase. With the, um, the figure that was put forward in October 17 was 3.5 million. And it's, now the figures have been bottomed out. It's actually 3.6. It's, it's Surrey's contribution to the 6.7 million pound scheme. Recommendation four is about moving some uh, permission to move some money internally to actually um, this is for contributions toward LEP schemes where we have a part contribution towards three or four LEP schemes and this is moving the money into that budget to allow us to, um, to make them contributions. Finally, within the capital budget, I'd like to make a point around the additional money that's being spent this year and the amount of schemes that have been delivered through the winter service project and the additional money that this council put in uh, to, to invest in Surrey's roads. We've so far delivered, and this is, although the budget is up to the end of September, I can tell you up to a couple of weeks ago, we've put, done 218 additional schemes on the ground, that's road repairs, um, and there are still 60 planned uh, left to be delivered this year, um, and they're on target to do that, which is great news. Um, there's the additional money coming forward next year um, where we'll deliver some more schemes. There's also the additional money that's come from government, the 7.4 million, and we're actually working through the, um, the members and local priority lists that have been done through the local committees to actually send, spend that 7.4 million again in the, local, um, in the local areas where it's needed and to bring them off the list. I will make a point here that this is great and we are making a difference to Surrey's roads, but it is the tip of the iceberg and actually it will be so much better to have fairer funding for our roads and have the money in our base budget so we can actually deliver a good quality road network on our roads. All this is firefighting and actually for the government to fairer fund Surrey's roads will be so much better. We can put it into the base budget and actually build the quality of our roads up over the years. And I just wanted to make that point, but congratulations to the team on having a short amount of time to organise, get this delivered on the ground. I think they've done a great job, and to our contractors as well. Okay. Uh, Mike? Yeah, I'll be very brief. The um, final outcome for the year we forecast to be virtually on line with budget. It's, it says 200,000 here, but we feel we will bring that in line with budget. There's some action still to be needed on the management side. And the only other thing is on point 38, the um, eco park, which we know it is delayed till next year, um, will lead to lower cost this year of around 13.5 million, and we will wish to put that into the sinking fund. But nothing else really to comment, sir.
Better comments from cabinet members. Are we all happy? I just want to pick up two things. One is at paragraph 77 of page 27A. You remember when the CARE Act came out in 2014, it stopped us placing a charge on individual properties where we were helping people. We, now we, we're not allowed to do that, and therefore our unsecured debt, uh, the, the debt is going higher and higher because we can't guarantee it being secured. So we have to watch that as we go along. It's not, fortunately, the total is not out of sync with even go back to 15 or 16, but over a period of time, the pressures will tell on us. And finally, I just want to pick up the Section 151 Officers Report, um, paragraph 96, 97, 98. It's really important that Cabinet members work with officers over the next six months so that we can achieve the full 40 million and the full 66 million. In order that, on page 277, our table 6, our reserves will not have to draw down any money from the 21 million earmarked. It would be a real step in the right direction if, we can, if by March next year we can get to that situation later in waiting. Okay, so the recommendations are on the front of our report, uh, which are recommendations one to four, where we've agreed to transfer 1.4, as Colin explained about the partnership and the Farnham Road and about the children's services. We note that very much. And I'd like to put recommendation five, that we write to the Secretary of State, reference paragraph um, 13, I think it was, Mary. Yes? Okay. Uh, are we all happy with that, then? Great. Okay, can we please show an agreement? Thank you. Excellent. David, before you close the meeting, can I just be permitted to say a few words, uh, as this is the last Cabinet meeting that you will chair? Uh, firstly, can I reassure you that I'm sure the new leader will be happy to consider you for a Cabinet role, uh, <laughs> uh, if you pull together a proper CV. Um, but uh, I, was, I was reminded of this the other day. I first met you in uh, 2004. Uh, I was standing behind you in the queue uh, for, uh, uh, for photographs for newly elected members. And I knew, that, I knew just from that, that first meeting that it was going to be a challenge. Uh, as you walked into the room, you started to rearrange the seating and tell a photographer where to stand <laughs> and everything else. But uh, over the past 14 years, as, as an elected member and as leader of this council, I mean, you have uh, served the residents with uh, enormous distinction. Uh, you have at all times put the residents' interests at heart. I mean, anybody that has served in your cabinet will know that, that you know, you can't, get, you can't get through a sentence without you saying, what about the residents, what about the residents? Uh, it, you know, it's been an interesting experience serving in the cabinet, um, uh, and, uh, it, but to be fair, an enjoyable one. Uh, you will be returning to the back benches, and part of our job as the cabinet will to be to try and distract the chairman from calling you to speak uh, on any uh, future items. Uh, but I know that... Um, uh, that, uh, you know, that, that uh, you, you'll be um, readily available, uh, hopefully not too, too available, um, to support the new leader uh, and, uh, <laughs> and the cabinet over the, the, the coming months. I mean, you will be uh, an almost impossible act uh, to follow, there's no doubt about that. Um, but I know that uh, all of us here, uh, you know, wish you uh, the very best and thank you for all that you've done for Surrey. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that, Tim. Um, so we will now go on to, to uh, the, under Section 108 of the Local Government Act 1972, the public be excluded from the meeting during the